Many of the questions that we wish to investigate during marketing analysis boil down to asking whether one variable, as it changes, tends to change or alter or correspond with a change in some other variable. In other words, as X changes, does Y change? As a consumer's brand loyalty goes up, does the amount of spending in cross-category purchasing also go up? As a consumer's preference for product reliability goes up, does the amount they're willing to spend on service maintenance plans go up? Or as a consumer's preference for hoppy beers goes up, does their willingness to pay for domestic light beers tend to decrease? Does the amount of dog pictures someone has on their social media account relate to the amount of money they spend on pet supplies? Let's think about that example a little more. Let me show you three different scatter plots that depict the amount of dog pictures on social media accounts and the annual spending on pet supplies. Each dot that you see here represents one person's response on a survey or data that we collected through some other means. Thinking through these three different potential sets of results, if I asked you to describe the relationship between each of the two variables, what kind of words would you, you use to describe them? Would you use words like weak or strong? Would it depend on which of the possibilities that you're looking at? Would you maybe consider the one on the far right hand side, possibility C, very strong? What we need here is some sort of compact, standardized, objective manner to characterize the strength of the relationship between two interval or ratio level variables. The arrows you see here are the linear relationships that we would, that we would depict that best fit each one of the data sets. The correlation coefficients are along the top. Let's learn a little bit more about what a correlation coefficient is and why it can be useful as part of our marketing analysis toolkit. First of all, when can we analyze with correlation coefficients? Well, there's a few prereqs. Both the X and Y variables are either interval or ratio level data. The relationship between the X and Y is monotonic. We'll talk about that shortly. And the relationship between the X and Y is at least reasonably well described as a linear relationship. There's a lot of different other ways to analyze, visualize, and report on these X, Y association questions. Correlation coefficients are just one compact way to quickly communicate how well a simple linear relationship exists between two interval or ratio variables. Look at these four scatter plots. If I asked you to draw a line or curvilinear line through each one to depict the nature of the relationship, how might you draw them? When I drew them, they looked something like this. Each one of these depicts what we mean by the word monotonic and linear. First, let's unpack that word monotonic. The word monotonic just means that it's always constantly increasing or de decreasing, but not necessarily at the same rate. So if we look at our two examples here on the left hand side, we can see that as X increases, Y also tends to increase. The rate of increase is different in the bottom left hand example, and it's constant in the upper left hand example, but these are both monotonic. The example in the upper right though is non-monotonic. That's because as X increases, First, Y has a tendency to decrease, but then eventually it increases. So there's clearly a relationship, but it's a non-monotonic relationship. Further, it's clear that relationships can be either linear or non-linear in nature. The upper left-hand corner, a straight line, does a good job of depicting the relationship between the X and Y variable. On the other hand, in the bottom left-hand side, we see a clear non-linear relationship or a curvilinear relationship here. Now we could attempt to draw a straight line to depict the relationship between the X and Y variable. In other words, try to force a linear relationship between these two. But it's clear that the curve of linear relationship does a better job of depicting that relationship. Well, finally, over here in the bottom right hand side, I showed an example of independent variables, meaning X and Y do not have any sort of relationship. We depict that usually by a straight horizontal line running between them. We can also depict linear associations between X and Y variables using a math equation. You recall this from your algebra class. The mathematical form for a simple linear relationship is simply Y equals A plus B times X. In other words, it's the equation for a straight line. Other ways you may see this depicted is simply variable 2 equals our y-intercept plus the slope times the variable, or aka 
if we're using regression, y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. These are all the same thing. They're all specifying the slope by the term that we're multiplying by x. And the constant, the a or the y-intercept or the beta 0, all represents where this line intersects on the y-axis when x is 0. When we use a simple math equation to show a relationship between two continuous variables, the linear relationship is unstandardized. It's unstandardized because that means we need to plug in the exact value of x in its original raw form to solve for what we think y is likely to be per the fit of the line, and that y will be interpreted in its original raw form, whether it be a score on a Likert scale or actual dollars spent on a product. When we report correlation coefficients, on the other hand, the linear relationship is standardized, meaning it's always normed to the range of negative 1 to positive 1. It doesn't matter what the scale is of the x or y variable, the correlation coefficient will always fall within this range. As we see here, the correlation is 0.84, a rather strong correlation, which is apparent by the, how well the simple straight line fits the data. It's important to note Students often confuse the word unstandardized and standardized in this context to be a value judgment of which one of these approaches is better or superior or good. That has nothing to do with it. The word unstandardized and standardized here is just characterizing the way we are describing the relationship. In some instances, the unstandardized form is far superior for our purposes. In our current video that we're working through here, we're focusing on the presentation of these in a standardized format, but that doesn't automatically mean it's magic or superior. It's just a different way of presenting the relationship between two variables. Why do we like to use that standardized format? Well, by always knowing that we're dealing with a value that has a range between negative one to positive one, regardless of the scale of the variables that we're comparing, it makes it a little easier for us to compare those two values across a different series of variables. In other words, we can compare multiple correlations across multiple variables at once. Also, because we always know the correlation coefficient will be between negative one and positive one, it's a little easier for us to have a quick intuitive grasp of the strength of the linear relationship between two variables. We always know that a correlation coefficient of zero means there is no linear relationship. A negative one means there, there is a perfect negative relationship between the two variables, and positive one means there's a perfect linear association. Even though we want to be clear that we're going to report these correlation coefficients in their exact numerical values from negative one to positive one, it is common for marketing researchers, or more commonly the audience that's receiving information about the correla correlation coefficient, to know whether we're dealing with a strong, medium, or weak correlation. They want a subjective interpretation. I'm actually quite hesitant to provide this information to you because the truth is it's an it depends style answer. What constitutes a meaningful, strong correlation is highly contextual to the particular type of data that you're dealing with. However, specific to the context of a cross-sectional consumer survey, so people are filling out survey questions and answering in a single shot survey, some very rough guidelines can be drawn. If we see a correlation coefficient from 0.5 to positive one or the negative converse, we tend to characterize that as a strong correlation between the two variables. 0.3 to 0.5 characterized as a moderate or medium correlation, 0.1 to 0.3 as small, and anything less than 0.1 approaching zero, we characterize as sort of no correlation. Again, I can't stress enough that we're just applying subjective labels which have different meaning to different people and shift depending on context to these numerical values. So this is just a gentle guideline. Always make sure you actually observe what the real correlation value is. Now, how do we calculate a correlation coefficient? Well, we're going to be focusing on the Pearson correlation. This is by far the most common way, but not the only way, to calculate a correlation coefficient. You can generally assume when someone says they're reporting correlations, they mean they're reporting the Pearson correlation. The equations are presented here, but fortunately for us, we're not going to worry about how we hand calculate these correlations. We're going to let Excel do the heavy lifting for us. So without any further ado, let's hop over into setting up our example that we're going to solve in Excel. So in this Excel example, Let's imagine I want to calculate the correlation coefficients between four different variables. My overall subjective knowledge about craft beer question, 
the two different questions that dealt with the maximum price people were willing to pay for six packs of beer, and the answer to the question about any beer that can get me drunk is a pretty good beer on a Likert scale. I would like the correlation coefficient for every possible pair of these four questions. In total, I want to derive six different correlation values. To do this in Excel, we are going to use the data analysis tool pack. It has a correlation option where we can do multiple correlations at once, but we're not quite ready to run this just yet. As is typical, we're gonna have to do a little data preparation first. Let's talk about the two things we're gonna have to solve. First, we're going to need to place all of the variables together, all in side-by-side -side columns. That's just the way that the data analysis tool pack wants it when you run correlations. We'll fix that easily enough. The second issue is we need to handle some missing values first. In some of these variables, we have some negative 999 values, meaning a respondent said that they don't know or have, don't have an answer or have no preference. We can't include these values when we want to compute a correlation. Correlations require that we have interval or ratio level data. A Likert scale from one to five is indeed interval, but the I don't know or no preference option doesn't fit within the scale. So we're gonna to have to exclude these respondents from our analysis. We'll fix that using an if function. Let's set up our game plan for solving these two issues next, and then we'll implement them in Excel. To solve the first problem, I'm simply going to add four new columns to the far right end of my data set that are simply just referring directly to the previous values earlier in the data set, where I need to actually make sure I'm filtering out those respondents who address answered negative 999 to one of my questions. I'll, as I've done in the past, I'll create a new column I'll call it analyze. I'll use an if function, and the if function is going to basically check to see if there was a negative 999 in any one of the four columns for any one respondent. And if there isn't, it'll return a value of one, meaning it's okay to analyze that record. And if not, meaning there is a negative 999 somewhere, it'll return a value of zero. Using this column, as I've done in the past, I will then sort my entire data set so that the analyzed records, the ones that I want to include are on the top, and the ones I don't want to include are placed at the bottom. This will get me all the way set up so that I can properly run the correlation analysis using the data analysis tool pack. Let's head over to Excel and execute these tasks. Now that our data set has been properly organized and ready to go for correlation analysis using the data analysis tool pack, we can go ahead and run it. Let's go do that in Excel, and then let's interpret those results.
Here's the results of our correlation analysis. We call this a correlation matrix, very typical way to report multiple correlations. Notice that the diagonal is a correlation of one. It's a not really <laughs> too meaningful. It's just saying that the correlation of a variable with itself is perfect. So we don't really drive much meaning from that. The rest of the correlation values here can be interpreted as following. Generally speaking, the correlations we're observing are mostly weak. It is a little interesting that the beer preference for drunk question was not really correlated at all with the maximum price someone's willing to pay for stone beer, but there was a weak positive correlation with their price willing to spend on Bud Light, suggesting there may be some association with the use of beer consumption for its effects more with domestic light beer rather than craft beer. Across the correlations we observed in our analysis, the most positive correlation was the maximum price someone was willing to spend on stone beer and a six pack of Bud Light. In other words, as people were willing to spend more on one, we'd expect them to be willing to spend more on the other, or conversely, less on one and less on the other. Ooh, there's one major limitation to this correlation matrix. This is reporting the correlation coefficients, but there's no actual statistical tests associated with these coefficients. That's a pretty big problem. Fortunately, the data analysis tool pack simply doesn't actually report the statistical tests of these correlation coefficients. Luckily, simple online calculators can be used to derive these, the results of these tests. We're going to set that up in the next few slides and then execute that game plan. Let's focus in on just one of the correlation coefficients as an example. The maximum price that someone's willing to spend on Bud Light and their preference for that any beer can get them drunk is a pretty good beer with a correlation coefficient of 0.21, which we interpreted as weak. Now our actual formal hypothesis is that there is no linear relationship between the price willing to pay for Bud Light and any beer that can get me drunk is a pretty good beer. Stated more completely, that was the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a linear relationship between the price willing to pay for Bud Light and any beer that can get me drunk is pretty good beer. And as typical, informally stated, which is common in marketing research, the alternative hypothesis is that there is some sort of linear relationship between these two. Stating this more succinctly, the null hypothesis we have here is that the R, the little r, correlation, is equal to zero, meaning no linear relationship. And the alternative is that R is not zero. Let's actually plug in the proper values to our online statistical calculator for correlation coefficients to evaluate this hypothesis. With the link provided to this video, I share an online calculator with you that'll calculate the confidence interval of this correlation coefficient. In that calculator, we'll set our typical confidence interval to 95%. We'll set our null hypothesis to zero, which we don't even plug into the calculator because it's such a default hypothesis that people specify for correlations. We'll set our observed correlation coefficient to 0.21, which we got from the Excel analysis. We also have to account for our sample size. Our sample size was not 230. Recall that we excluded three respondents from our analysis because they answered negative 999 to at least one of the questions. When we implement that analysis, we get a lower and upper 95% confidence interval estimate of our correlation coefficient. Recall that our null hypothesis was that the correlation coefficient was zero. However, we actually observed a correlation coefficient in our sample of 0.21. Remember, our goal is we want to project this correlation coefficient to generalize to our population at whole. But we're not entirely certain because of sampling error. Our lower and upper boundary of this correlation coefficient say that it's somewhere between 0.08 and 0.33 with 95% confidence. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis that the correlation is zero. How do we report this? The extensive reporting would look as follows. The correlation between willingness to pay for Bud Light and agreement with the statement that any beer that could get them drunk is a good beer was positive and weak, R equals 0.21. The 95% confidence interval of this correlation, the lower R of 0.08, upper R of 0.33, did not include the null hypothesis that there was no linear relationship, R equals zero. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. A more compact version of this reporting, if we think our audience understands the basic testing associated with correlation coefficients, 
we would just simply write the correlation between willingness to pay for Bud Light and agreement with the statement that any beer that could get them drunk is a good beer was positive and weak, R equals 0.21, but statistically significant. Notice that we dropped off a whole bunch of language describing the statistical test there. Remember, we have to be cautious if we use more compact reporting. That presumes our audience understands and can follow along with many of the basic assumptions we made with our testing. They have to know that our null hypothesis was zero. They have to know that we're using the default 95% confidence level. And we're trusting that when we say the phrase statistically significant, we know that they understand what that really means. As always, when deciding upon how we're going to report the results of our statistical analysis, we have to think carefully about our audience who's going to be reading the report and the needs of that report. Typically, when we report about correlations, we usually have many different correlation coefficients we need to report at once. In a professional report, a correlation matrix is usually properly formatted to clearly communicate many things at once to the audience. This version of the correlation matrix you see here would represent one that is appropriate for a final report. Notice there's a few additional characteristics from the results than the results that we saw just coming from Excel. First, we used clear labels describing the actual variables that were measured here in the rows, and we added numbers to correspond them all across the columns so people can match them easily. We also separately ran summary statistics, getting the mean and standard deviation for each one of these variables. That didn't come from the initial correlation analysis. We did this work on our own separately. Also common, Notice there's four bolded values here among our six correlations. I ran statistical tests for all six of these correlation coefficients. The ones that are bolded were statistically significant at a 95% level of confidence. It's very common that we flag those statistically significant correlations to our managers. What about visual analysis of correlation coefficients? Shouldn't we just be showing people scatter plots? The answer is yes, with a strong caveat. Let's see what I mean next. As we saw previously, there was a pretty weak correlation between max price and one's willing to spend on Bud Light and their beer, beer preference uh, for beer getting them drunk being a good beer. What if we wanted to visualize this relationship with a simple scatter plot? Since the two variables are right next to each other in Excel, it's very easy for us to create a scatter plot. Just simply select the two columns of course, ignoring those last three values that we want to skip. We just go to Insert, and under our Chart Options here, we just need to create a simple scatter plot. And what the heck is going on here? I see sort of a grid of dots. Now, before we do any formatting, which I'm not going to bother to do because this, this scatter plot is not very helpful, notice that the y-axis has values on the 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that's our Likert scale here about the beer preference for drunk. And down here we have values from 2 up to 12. Those are the dollar amounts related to people's willing to spend for Bud Light. Why do we have this weird sort of dotted, perfectly squared off board rather than the sort of nice, pretty, uh, easy to visualize scatter plots we're used to seeing in our examples? Well, what's going on here? is that these are the only, each one of these dots probably represents many different values of our uh, 227 respondents that we have in here. That's because each person was only able to answer an exact dollar amount for Bud Light Beer and only able to give an answer from one to five in exact numerical instruments on the Likert scale. There were no half answers or fractional answers to any of these questions. So we have a whole bunch of data points hiding underneath some of these dots and it's impossible for us, the viewer, to understand which of these dots have many values or very few values underneath them. So unfortunately, in this particular setup, uh, because of the way we measured our interval and ratio data, a scatter plot isn't nearly as revealing as we want it to be. Now there's two solutions here. One, which I won't show, is something called adding a jitter. What a jitter does is it adds a small random amount of noise to every single one of the data points. So each one of our 227 records would have a small positive or negative value randomly added to it. 
by nudging the data with a little bit of random noise, it'll spread the data out a little bit. So when we run a scatter plot, it'll be easier to see the pattern of data if one exists. That's one approach. Another approach is we can actually use a more heat map approach with a pivot table to try to see if we can see distributions or patterns of results in a visual way that way. Let's try that out. So I'm just going to keep these two columns uh, selected. That's all I need. And I'm going to insert a pivot table. And it'll only grab these two columns that I have selected and only the 227 values. Now I'm going to place my Bud Light variable into my row. So these are the dollar amounts people are going to pay. And here's in the columns all the different options from 1 to 5. Now it doesn't matter which one I gra grab into my values. But it's important that I don't report the sum. I just want to report the count. So I switch to value field settings and select the count. And let's see how this could be useful to us. First, we actually don't care about the grand totals right now. So if I right click on this, I can remove the grand total. Right click on this, I can remove the grand total. I just want to see the numerical values that are inside here. Now, all I'm seeing here is my 227 people that I'm analyzing. For example, cell here, I see that on the five point Likert scale, this was two. So the people who disagree, not strongly disagree, just disagree with a beer getting them drunk is a pretty good beer. And $6 they'd be willing to spend for Bud Light. So this was my most common answer. Now, a way to make it a little easier for me to see sort of the pattern of where answer patterns are or pairs of answers are common or uncommon is I could select this whole grid here and I could add some colorized conditional formatting. So if under home and I go to conditional formatting, I could go to color scales and the first option here using green to red continuum, it shows me where there's high and low patterns of answers. Now this isn't perfect. Notice that where there are no answers at all, which is zero, it doesn't colorize them. Obviously, those would be the, if I want to use this to depict a uh, propensity to answer, I'd want that to be the darkest shade of red. So there's a little bit of work to do still. But what this does do is it allows the viewer to begin to visually, through the use of color, to get a sense of where there's high and low patterns of answers. Now, this is an imperfect solution, and I'm not going to keep going in depth here. Do we maybe delete the actual numerical values? Do we switch them to a percent of total? Do we use an entirely different approach to the color scheme, maybe from dark black to white? A lot of different choices here. What I am trying to illustrate is that this is a alternative approach to try to show patterns between two variables when a scatter plot approach isn't as appropriate because of the way the questions were measured. Now that we understand how to implement and report correlation coefficients using Excel, let's talk about some of the limitations that commonly exist with reporting correlation coefficients. We do know that the wonderful aspect of correlation coefficients are that they are a quick and compact way to quickly communicate the strength of a linear relationship between two variables. And we can report many of them compactly all at once with something like a correlation matrix table. However, this exact strength is actually the source of a weakness when it comes to correlation coefficients. Without proper care by the analyst or understanding by the reader who's reading about correlation coefficients, it is possible that correlation coefficients alone might hide important relationships between two variables or, in some instances, exaggerate the strength of a relationship between two variables. Let's see some examples of that. Take a look at these four different scatter plots. See that blue line? That is the linear relationship or the correlation coefficient that we would find for each one of these four different scatter plots. Notice that the blue line is exactly the same, meaning the correlation coefficient would be exactly the same. Yet, by simply looking at these four different scatter plots, we can clearly tell that the relationship between the x and the y variable is entirely different between them. These four scatter plots Illustrating this point are a rather famous set of scatter plots called Anscom's Quartet. An even more enjoyable way to understand how the nature of an x and y variable can be very different, yet result in the exact same correlation coefficient, can be seen in this neat animated data visualization. 
Look at the scatter plot change rapidly between different iterations. Each one depicts a unique type of relationship, including a dinosaur. What's important for us to understand is notice that the correlation coefficient always stays exactly the same, even though the relationship clearly changes between each one of these iterations. This again underscores the importance of understanding that a correlation coefficient only tells you the strength of the linear relationship between two variables. If there's a nonlinear relationship that exists between the two variables, we'll simply miss it. Another issue that's common with correlation coefficients is that they might accidentally exaggerate the strength of a relationship between two variables, especially if we're dealing with a less technically sound audience who might not have a sophisticated understanding of a correlation coefficient. Look at this scatter plot. It has an R squared of 0.06, which would correspond to a correlation coefficient of 0.24. Now some audiences might see that correlation coefficient of 0.24 and in their mind, come up with the interpretation that there is some sort of meaningful relationship between these two variables. When we look at the scatter plot, we can tell that's not really the case though, where Rexlor the dog bear is drawn here, and the famous comic strip XKCD notes that they don't trust linear regressions when it's harder to guess the direction of the correlation from the scatter plot than to find new constellations on it. Not a bad rule of thumb. If you can draw a new night sky constellation rather than a correlation coefficient that's meaningful, maybe you're looking for a correlation coefficient that really shouldn't be reported. Finally, keep in mind that correlation coefficients are just one way to fit a math equation between an x and y variable. There's a variety of different curve fitting methods that we might want to use. We don't cover all of these, but they are commonly used in marketing research and analytics. The correlation here is just one simple method. Notice that each one of these scatter plots that I'm showing you here, all 12 of them, has the exact same underlying data. The pattern of the dots is the same, yet the 12 different curve fitting methods result in entirely different mathematical equations. This teaches us that the use of the fitting method that we use needs to be supported by theory and a clear understanding of why we're doing it. Otherwise, we're going to get teased by statistic nerd comic strips. Yet again, thanks XKCD, illustrating the importance of being careful about how we conduct our analysis. So how do we overcome the weaknesses related to reporting correlation coefficients? Well, when we're analyzing it, first think about your theory. Think carefully about how the x and y variable might really be related. Is it more complex than a simple linear relationship? If so, a correlation coefficient may not be appropriate. Second, check it visually. In all of the previous examples, the way that I showed you that a linear relationship wasn't doing a good job of depicting the relationship between an x and y variable was by way of a scatter plot. Visualizing your data with scatter plots can be an excellent way to quickly check for nonlinearity. When reporting your results, don't just report the correlation coefficient for high stakes variable relationships. Instead, also show them visually to your audience so that they can come to their own conclusions or better understand what that correlation coefficient really means. So we can use scatter plots or other techniques that show the relationship between two variables. Of course, we have to be very selective about which data visualizations we use. They can take up a lot of space. So focus on using these visualizations for your sort of high stakes part of your analysis. Also, we should be clear to our audiences that when we're reporting statistically significant correlations, all that means is that the correlation between the two variables is probably not zero. In other words, we rejected the null hypothesis of it being zero. That doesn't automatically mean that the correlation is managerially important. A correlation coefficient of say 0.15 could absolutely be statistically significant if we have a sufficiently large sample size. That doesn't automatically mean that it means something for management.